The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hello and welcome to Health for a Lifetime. I'm your host Don McIntosh and today we're going to talk about digestion. We're going to talk about some problems that can be encountered with our digestive system. Talking with us today is Dr. Neil Nedley. He's from Ardmore, Oklahoma. Welcome Dr. Nedley. Thank you. And Good you deal here. with all the organ systems and uh, of course the, the alimentary canal or the digestive system is something that causes people, well, many blessings but also some problems. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, one of my uh, fields, in fact, it's probably one of my primary emphasis in internal medicine is the field of gastroenterology. Uh, and that has to do with the entire gastrointestinal tract. Okay. So we're going to talk about what's called GERD. What does that mean? Gastroesophageal reflux disease is what it stands for. And of course, the gastro, that's where the acid is made. The esophagus is above where the stomach is. And then you have reflux, which means there are stomach contents refluxing backwards where they're really not supposed to go into the esophagus. And of course, that can produce disease. So that's the, the term, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, well, let's talk about how it's supposed to work first, the digestive system. Well, digestion actually begins in the mouth. Uh, that's how the uh, digestion begins and we actually have a graphic uh, in regards to the uh, the mouth components that's actually something that we have voluntary control over the rest of the digestive tract we really don't have much voluntary control but we have control over the type of food or fluid we put into our mouth we have control when we put the food or fluid into our mouth okay uh, we also have control over the temperature of what we put in to a large extent and then we also have control over how long we chew and savor the food. So we have quite a bit of control. Quite a bit of control in the first part of the digestive system, which is the mouth. So, so what types, uh, well, you know, you said digestion begins in the mouth, but doesn't it begin in the mind? I mean, sometimes I'll think about something and my mouth will start to salivate. <laughs> yes, it can. Uh, Condition response, uh, so to speak. And uh, yes, if we think about something uh, like that, we can, or even if we come across a smell, for instance, uh, then the digestive juices can start going. And uh, also on timing, if we're used to being on a regular pattern every day, which is actually healthier to be that way, uh, if we don't happen to eat at that particular time, my digestive juices go into action, and that's inefficiency if we're not eating at that time. So the type of food we put or fluid we put in our mouths, what types of things, I mean, it's pretty obvious, don't put uh, nuts, bolts, and all <laughs> kinds of stuff in your mouth. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think a lot of people make uh, mistakes concerning that. Absolutely, they make mistakes concerning it. And that's one of the reasons why gastroesophageal reflux disease is so prominent. Our next uh, slide actually uh, shows some of the... Um, uh, the symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Heartburn after a heavy meal uh, or when you're bending over or when you're lifting, uh, when that occurs, that's abnormal and that's one of the most common, prominent symptoms is heartburn. Uh, it, when heartburn occurs when lying down, particularly at night or on the back, uh, that is also gastroesophageal reflux disease. Three quarters of people would, with GERD will experience nighttime symptoms. It might even awaken them from night with this burning. And then they can get into regurgitation as well, where they Throwing just, up. Um, well, it's not really vomiting, but they'll actually um, begin to taste the okay. stomach contents there in the back of the throat or, or in the mouth. And is this a, 
And it's an acute, uh, is this something that's chronic or acute, or depending on, if you have a big meal, you're going to have this? Well, uh, many people, in fact, uh, it's estimated that about 40% of people will suffer from GERD uh, in any given year. And so gastroesophageal reflux disease is pretty, um, uh, pretty common. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then some people, about 20%, get into the severe GERD where actual complications can occur. But what I mean is, you know, the curse does not come causeless. I mean, you know that if you ate this big, huge meal and then you have some of these problems that you're talking about that night, you, you know exactly what that came from. That's right. Is that, from the big is, meal. Is that different than what you're talking about in terms of GERD? No, uh, no matter what the cause of the GERD, GERD is GERD. GERD is GERD. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's due to a heavy meal, a voluntary GERD, for instance, uh, or, you know, you, maybe you weren't informed in regards to that that food would do that. But uh, basically, any time we get reflux, uh, rather persistent reflux of stomach contents back into the esophagus, that's GERD. Okay. So what are the risk factors for GERD? Well, the risk factors for GERD, we actually have a graphic about that as well. Uh, heavy meal, you talked about that. Uh, if you're snacking uh, at any time, that's a risk factor, but particularly snacking before bedtime is going to dramatically increase the, in the incidence of GERD. High fat foods uh, will also increase the incidence. It takes a lot longer for the fa high fat foods to be digested and for the stomach to empty out. Uh, if you're in your third trimester of pregnancy, Mm. Uh, the pressure that's put on your abdomen uh, makes it much easier to uh, reflux. And then there are additional risk factors. If you have uh, asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or respiratory disease, you often are using your accessory muscles in your abdomen to breathe. That can produce pressure and can cause reflux. Tight clothing, uh, particularly around the abdomen itself, will dramatically uh, increase reflux. And uh, many uh, uh, women that are slightly overweight uh, utilize these tight clothing um, well, This you know, pushes everything up, and and including the food, huh? <laughs> that's right. Uh, tobacco. Uh, nicotine actually relaxes the esophageal sphincter and allows acid to freely come into the esophagus. Mm. Uh, alcohol also relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter and can cause acid reflux. And then the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, abbreviated NSAIDs. These are drugs like ibuprofen, uh, Naprosyn, Aleve, um, you know, Celebrex, uh, these type of drugs uh, can significantly increase the risk. And then other drugs such as uh, the nitroglycerin medicines. Nitroglycerin actually relaxes smooth muscle. The lower esophageal sphincter is a smooth muscle. Uh, calcium channel blockers also can cause reflux. And then an anatomical problem called a hiatal hernia can increase the risk. And then many people are unaware that caffeine, peppermint, and chocolate uh, significantly increase the risk of gastroesophageal reflux disease. How does that work? Uh, caffeine increases acid production and relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter, so it's working two ways. And peppermint does the same? Peppermint actually does uh, relax smooth muscle and it will relax the lower esophageal uh, sphincter. In fact, sometimes for spasm disorders of the intestinal tract, we'll recommend peppermint uh, as a treatment because peppermint will relax the spasm. Mm. But for the average person, you don't want a relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, food is not supposed to go back into the esophagus. It's supposed to go the other way. And as we relax that and the stomach contracts, uh, it'll come right back up into the esophagus with peppermint on board. Okay. What about obesity? Obesity uh, will significantly increase the risk of reflux, and it's one of the reasons why we're seeing much more GERD today, because the waistlines are increasing. Obesity, again, is increasing the intra-abdominal pressure, and that intra-abdominal pressure, uh, no matter what it's due to, third trimester of pregnancy or obesity, uh, can significantly increase the reflux. You know, I've seen these CAT scans of, uh, of obese people and really the issue is not what you see outside, it's what is inside, the fat that's inside. That's and right. I think that people don't really They don't realize, realize that's that. all crammed in there. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 the reason it's pushing out is because it's already crammed in. So just a little, a little belly can yeah. be 
a big problem. And when you do surgery on these individuals, you really find that out. I mean, you open up that abdomen, that fat just, you know, comes forth, so to speak, uh, because it's uh, been so confined. Okay, so um, when is it that you should do a procedure and figure out uh, what's going on? I mean, these are all the risk factors. When do you actually uh, go in and do a procedure? Well, uh, we, it is recommended now by the American Cancer Society that anybody who has had reflux intermittently for five years or more should undergo an endoscopy uh, to have that esophagus looked at. It's also recommended that anyone who has what's called dysphagia or odynophagia. Dysphagia is difficulty in swallowing. That means after you, you know, take some bread or maybe uh, eat some solid food, it kind of hangs up in the esophagus before it passes through. That's not normal, uh, and uh, that, that endoscopy needs to be done right away. Uh, odynophagia is painful swallowing, and if anyone has pain at all when they swallow, that's an indication to get that uh, esophagus looked at. And I think you have a graphic on uh, something you call EGD. Yes. An EGD is the procedure where we take a camera on a, uh, uh, the end of a scope. It's a thin scope, it's about as big around as my little finger uh, here. It's flexible, has a light on the end of it, and uh, with that light we can get some very sophisticated uh, pictures of the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum. And that scope is called an EGD. It stands for esophago gastro uh, duodenoscopy and uh, we do have a graphic on that. All right, well, let's look at it. It's recommended when you have heartburn for five years or more. Yes, or if you've had persistent symptoms despite being on antacids or something like that, that would be another indication. And that picture that you see there on the screen is actually reflux. That scope is in the esophagus there, and what you are seeing is actually acid and other stomach contents coming back up that lower esophageal sphincter into the esophagus itself. So sometimes on endoscopy, we will see that in real time, the actual esophageal sphincter being weak and that uh, reflux occurring right into our lens, uh, so to speak. All right, so any other indications? Uh, I think your graphic continues. Yes. Uh, as well. Yeah, the uh, other indications, uh, well, these are actual complications. Uh, this particular graphic is the complications of reflux. And notice the erosions there, erosive esophagitis. Uh, those are actual ulcerations. That white area on top of that red area is about the 6 o'clock position. That's actually purulent material or pus-type material uh, that's right there in the erosions and you're seeing erosions in several areas there in the esophagus and then sometimes a discrete ulcer can form. That's the picture on the right hand side is the ulcer. Then we can get stricture. A stricture is due to scar tissue forming with all of that reflux and actually narrowing that down uh, to the point where the individual's food starts hanging up before it passes down through. And then a very um, significant severe condition called Barrett's esophagus. This is where the esophagus changes its mucosa permanently uh, into a Barrett's type esophagus, which increases the risk of malignancy. So these complications and uh, what causes them, it's very significant, really, and uh, can get, go from bad to worse, it looks like. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, those complications can produce uh, further complications. Well, we want to come back. We're talking with Dr. Neil Nedley. We're going to look a little bit more of those complications, but also some solutions. Join us when we come back. Are you confused about the endless stream of new and often contradictory health information? With companies trying to sell new drugs and special interest groups paying for studies that spin the facts, where can you find a common sense approach to health? One way is to ask for your free copy of Dr. Arnott's 24 Realistic Ways to Improve Your Health. Dr. Timothy Arnott and the Lifestyle Center of America produced this helpful booklet of 24 short, practical health tips based on scientific research and the Bible that will help you live longer, happier, and healthier. For example, did you know that women who drink more water lower the risk of heart attack? 
or that seven to eight hours of sleep a night can minimize your risk of ever developing diabetes. Find out how to lower your blood pressure and much more. If you're looking for help, not hype, then this booklet's for you. Just log on to 3abn.org and click on free offers or call us during regular business hours. You'll be glad you did. Welcome back. We've been talking with Dr. Neil Nutley. We've been talking about digestion, and it's a wonderful thing if it's working well. <laughs> but what we have discovered is that many times it doesn't work well. Dr. Nelly, this is because of choices that we make. Food that we eat, when we eat it, the temperature of it, all these different things. That's right. Actually, the stomach uh, has to have four things that are constant for the end of the stomach, the pylorus, to begin to empty the food into the intestinal tract. And those four things, it has to have a constant pH. Well, so that's the acid Ba uh -huh. base. And there are sensors in the duodenum that will sample the food as it's emptied from the stomach and if it's not a constant pH, a constant temperature and a constant osmolarity, or if the size is too big, if it's greater than a millimeter squared, it will actually clamp that pylorus down to keep so working the stomach can mix it all up to get that constant and then it will begin to sample it again. And that's one of the reasons why it, eating between meals is one of the worst things that can happen for an individual uh, as far as initiating reflux is concerned because the stomach may have things all ready and then some new food is put down in there before it has a chance to completely empty. The pylorus has to clamp down and begin to emulsify and to mix that food up to try to get those constant readings. Probably why it's important to chew as well. That's right. Chewing thoroughly will help our stomach out significantly to get those sizes, again, less than a millimeter squared is what the duodenum is looking for. Now, we were looking at some complications, and I want to go through those again uh, and for those who maybe are just joining us and show us what these are. Yes, erosive esophagitis uh, that's graphed there. One of the things that erosive esophagitis and ulcerations, both of those can cause, is bleeding. We will often see a person with anemia due to reflux. Mm. Uh, and the reflux causes microscopic bleeding or maybe massive bleeding. Some of the ulcers in the esophagus can bleed rather readily, can erode into a blood vessel and you can start vomiting up blood and get massive bleeding as a complication of reflux. Uh, the next uh, slide also uh, shows some additional complications of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And, uh, and that is a stricture. That's where food starts to hang up. What we will do with that stricture when we see it is we'll take a balloon dilator with the scope and open that up so that the individual can swallow like they used to. Does that hurt? Well, we have them under anesthesia, so it doesn't hurt at the time. But uh, it will only last for maybe up to three years. The stricture will come back again. The scar tissue will form again. Some people have to have that dilated every six months. And what started the whole process off was reflux. And then Barrett's esophagus that you saw on the screen there, uh, Barrett's is actually a change in the mucosa uh, to an abnormal mucosa that can actually initiate uh, cancer. And this is why once we find Barrett's esophagus, that individual has to be scoped every year or maybe every two years to make sure that the beginnings of malignancy are not starting to form. And that's because the cells are uh, multiplying and they are kind of abnormal cells already. Yes, the columnar epithelium uh, of Barrett's esophagus uh, is abnormal and it does uh, help bring about um, uh, cancer in some instances. Now most people with Barrett's, if we know about it ahead of time, we can put them on a program uh, so that it reduces the likelihood of them developing cancer, but still we need to find out. And then our last uh, a graphic in regards to the complications is actually cancer itself. This starts out with Barrett's esophagus and then it goes into adenocarcinoma, a glandular cancer. And there's two different patients there uh, on the screen that we had uh, and both of them uh, did not get scoped like they were supposed to in following up their Barrett's and so they ended up with adenocarcinoma. And adenocarcinoma is the fastest rising cancer in the United States. Mm. It's dramatically increasing, and it's increasing because reflux is increasing, and that's why we're having a program on this, because if we can prevent the reflux, 
or treat the reflux, we can prevent cancer. And the, the unfortunate thing about adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, death within a year in virtually all cases. Mm. Very few people are spared. We'll do surgery, we'll do radiation, we'll do chemo. Those things can prolong the life to some extent, but normally it's still death within a year. Once you get it, that's it usually. Yeah, and so that's why we want to catch it in the dysplastic form before it gets to the cancer form because then we can prevent the deaths uh, completely. So someone that's having some of those symptoms we talked about early on, don't just dismiss those. Make sure that you either amend your lifestyle so they don't come about, or if they continue to, make sure and see someone like yourself. That's right, uh, to be sure. You know, interesting in the Bible, um, it says that at the end of time, people will be struggling uh, because their God is their belly. Do you <laughs> think this is kind of related to that? Absolutely, yes. People's uh, choices of what they're putting into their food, and particularly the overeating, the high-fat meals, those type of things are lending uh, to gastroesophageal reflux disease. The alcohol as well. I mean, there's a marked increased risk of adenocarcinoma in those that drink and smoke as well. So let's talk about treatment. Well, the treatment uh, actually first should be diet, actually, and lifestyle measures. And we have a graphic uh, in regards to the actual uh, treatment. But lifestyle and dietary change. 44% uh, of patients will experience relief of symptoms with modest changes in their diet. Now, these aren't significant changes, but modest changes. And those, uh, if we do significant changes, 80% of patients experience relief with bold dietary and lifestyle changes. So what are we talking about in these changes? Are we talking about chewing your food? That's right, chewing the food adequately and thoroughly savoring the food, taking time for that. Actually, if we're not eating in a stressful environment, it's one of the reasons why we want to be stress-free with good conversation and those type of things. Uh, and savoring the food, chewing thoroughly, will help significantly in preventing reflux. Uh, secondly, the type of food that we're eating. The modest changes that we recommend in virtually everyone is no caffeine, decaf even. Decaf has tannins uh, in it, uh, and the tannins uh, will actually also cause reflux. Uh, chocolate, chocolate weakens the lower esophageal sphincter, uh, and so we have everyone avoid chocolate, peppermint, spearmint, and alcohol. Also eliminating carbonated drinks. The carbonated drinks, because of the air, the carbon dioxide that's in them, will tend to come right back up. Uh, that's mm -hmm. why people tend to belch afterwards. Decreasing the size of the meal. Uh, and so this, this is what we recommend in virtually uh, every individual. If they're overweight, they need to lose weight down to their ideal weight to get that intra-abdominal pressure under control. Thoroughly chewing the food and then increasing whole grains rich in selenium has also been shown to be helpful uh, in preventing reflux. What is selenium? Selenium is a trace mineral uh, okay. that's present uh, particularly in grains from the Dakotas. And then uh, the more aggressive measures that we would recommend in some people, and this is where we can get, increase the yield from 44 to 80 percent. More aggressive measures are avoiding acidic foods such as oranges, lemons, grapefruit, pineapple, tomatoes. A lot of people don't realize meat is an acidic food, and it very much is. And then uh, not eating fruits and vegetables at the same meal. Uh, it's good to eat your fruits at one meal, vegetables at another. For people that don't have reflux problems, there's no problems eating fruits and vegetables at the same meal. But if you are having problems with reflux and you've tried the, the common measures and you're not in that 44% category that experience uh, relief from the common measures, then we would recommend more aggressive measures and that would be not eating fruits and vegetables at the same meal and even avoiding, completely avoiding certain types of fruits that are high in acid content. Well, this is talking about significant changes in, in, in things that people usually don't like to be talked with about. I mean, people want to eat what they want to eat, when they want to eat it, how they want to eat it. And uh, so, have you had success in talking with your patients about this? Well, absolutely. People uh, tend not to want to be dependent on medicines for life. And although if you have an erosion or an ulcer, we are going to put you on a medicine to actually block your stomach from producing acid. So even if you are refluxing, the acid's not at least going up into the esophagus. Uh, and we'll have you on that for eight weeks, but eight weeks will cure it. 
uh, in most cases. And then if you're on a good lifestyle program, you won't need medicine the rest of your life. But otherwise, you're going to need to take these expensive medicines. And a lot of these drugs are expensive, $130 a month. Uh, that you're having to pay out, and they also can have side effects. Uh, the medicines that help reflux can cause abdominal pain. It can decrease the absorption of vitamin B12, uh, for instance, because you're not producing that acid, which can help with the absorption of B12. Well, what about the person that says, well, you know, my family's always just had bad stomachs. It's just because of my family history. Huh. Well, people may have a genetic predisposition to a weak lower esophageal sphincter and they may have a predisposition to obesity genetically, uh, but uh, despite those genetic predispositions, if we're on a, a good diet, 80% of those individuals um, will not need to take medicine. Mm -hmm. And so they can control it uh, with their diet and lifestyle. Well, you know, uh, you are a Christian physician. What kind of spiritual lessons do you draw from the digestive system and when you talk with people? Uh, how do you point them to the master? Well, we point them to the master by being able to change our lifestyle. All of us are creatures of habit, uh, and we, uh, as human beings, don't like to change uh, that readily. But uh, if we know that it's best for us to change, we still can't change unless we have the Holy Spirit working in our life. And if we just uh, simply ask God to help us with the change, uh, He knows that we need to change. And we are willing to do our part. At first, it seems like a tremendous sacrifice for people to, to leave out some of these items in their diet, particularly the more addictive substances. I mean, chocolate can be addictive. Alcohol can be addictive. Uh, but studies show repeatedly that if we do our part and we are willing to make that decision to change, if we rely upon God, even the 12-step program it works with food as well, let go and let God, mm -hmm. uh, God can indeed help us to completely change our life. And that's why when we leave the spiritual component out of giving information, uh, we're really leaving out the power uh, for people to change and change permanently. You know, sometimes people have their stomachs clamped or this gastric resection. Does this cause problems with uh, this kind of uh, esophageal problems that you've mentioned? Yes, it can. The, the stomach surgeries that are done can lead to more reflux. Uh, that's true. Of course, there is a surgery that tries to get rid of reflux. It's called a fundoplication, where the stomach is wrapped around the esophagus. And that might help with reflux, but the individual will never be able to belch or vomit again. Uh, okay. And that can produce bloating and other types of symptoms. So we just trade one disease for another sometimes with these surgeries. We've been talking with Dr. Neil Nedley. We've been talking about the wonderful, divinely inspired digestive system. And we've talked about how we can uh, really complicate it. But we've also seen that there's good news. A large percentage of you <laughs> that are struggling with these things can actually stop them and reverse them with just simple changes. We encourage you to do that. We're thankful that you watched today. We hope that you have health that lasts for a lifetime.